Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. We all know the saying, you are what you eat, but how about you are what you wear? During her recent state visit to Germany, Governor General of Canada, Mary May Simon, decided to don seal skin during meetings with German leaders, promoting Inuit pride while addressing a controversial trade policy. Lindsay Richardson explains. Under a black sky, Canada's guests of honour pulled up to Berlin's presidential mansion, donning their finest black ties and evening gowns. Governor General Mary May Simon came equipped with a conversation starter, this necklace, which she wore again in a sit-down interview with APTN News. It's from Iqaluit, and I had a friend um, bring it to me because I wanted something to wear in uh, Germany that was made from seal. Hailing from the northern Quebec region known as Nunavik, Simon's worn Inuit culture on her sleeve since her appointment to the role in July. But in Germany, where sealskin has been banned since 2010, Simon's stylish choice makes a statement. That we depend on the seal for food and for many other things and also for the fur. So we use the whole animal. When they asked me about my necklace, I get to talk about it like that. So I'm educating people in Germany about who we are as well as learning about Germany. So it's been a really uh, very good dialogue. In 2021, there are 36 international trade bans on seal products worldwide. They're most common in the European Union. Germany once had the second largest market for Canadian seal pelts. If you look hard enough, you may find a garment forgotten in the back of an antique store. European disapproval is easier to spot. Canadian assassin. Eh bien, c'est fini. Ça doit cesser. The 2016 NFB documentary Angry Inuk looked closely at this fallout, how it fuels poverty, and how it affects international perceptions of Inuit culture. They've been fighting the decision at the highest levels for years. And through their accessories, Simon and other delegates fought misconceptions during the recent state visit to Germany. We cannot adapt. We, we cannot start growing cows in our homeland. And we're not going to, and we're not going to change that because another culture is, is telling us that we should. Lisa Koperkwaluk hails from Pavernatuk, a community also in Nunavik, an Inuk of many titles. She served as de facto cultural support for Simon in Germany, proudly wearing seal all the while. I really want people to know that it's part of who we are, uh, I want it to, to, to be seen that I support uh, our Inuit harvesters and um, if people ask me, oh, what is this made of? Uh, and I say seal skin and say, oh, um, poor baby seal. And, and I say, well, uh, poor baby, poor baby, poor veal or poor baby pig, you know. Um, it's uh, so important for me to show that it's part of our culture. All past and future controversy aside. Doesn't stop us from showcasing it. We always have done that and we will continue to do that. Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News, Berlin. Staying overseas now, it's day two of the COP26 Global Climate Conference in Glasgow, Scotland. And the last day, world leaders are in attendance. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau took the opportunity to make a pitch for carbon pricing. Trudeau played a prominent role in a panel discussion where he called Canada's carbon price one of the most ambitious and stringent in the world. But he stressed it hasn't been easy. Canada isn't some magical place uh, where it's easy to do difficult, progressive things. Uh, it's hard to do them in Canada, as it is all across, all around the world, when we want to make the big, right changes we need to do. 
Meantime, it's being heralded as the biggest achievement yet of the Young Conference. More than 100 countries, including Canada, have pledged to end deforestation in the coming decade. More leaders than ever before have now signed up to protect our forests from countries in the north and the south with temperate forests, tropical forests and including nations like China, Russia, Brazil, some of the largest forest estates in the world. And the UK government says it has received commitments from leaders representing more than 85% of the world's forests. More than $23 billion Canadian in public and private funds have been pledged towards the plan. Skokowin James Harper is with the Indigenous Clean Energy Delegation. He's attending the COP26 conference and joins us now from Glasgow. Skokowin, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, can you tell us how it's going in Scotland? Uh, what are some of the highlights being for you? Yeah, uh, thank you for having me. Um, for for starters, it's it's a little bit overwhelming. The conference is is well attended, and and there's a lot of discussions happening uh, on emission reductions, on on mitigating basically uh, climate change, but also on on adaptation as well. Um, and I've been very close with the Indigenous Peoples uh, constituency and the caucus here, and and representing my nation. Uh, Surgeon Lake, uh, Treaty 8 territory, as much as I can. More than uh, 100 countries have signed on to this uh, plan to end deforestation by 2030. How do you uh, think that that pledge will affect Canada's forests? Yeah, um, so it's in principle, it's, it's a very strong policy and it's one that is long overdue. Uh, but to be honest, um, you know, a lot of our delegation is very wary about nature-based solutions in general from a variety of nations worldwide um, that are recognizing that, that the value of, of natural biosystems and biospheres have on storing and, and sequestering carbon. Um, but we're very concerned that it is a, a veiled attempt to continually control uh, indigenous uh, conserved and protected territories. Um, so we're, we're keeping a close eye on the language that is being used and that it is inclusive and ultimately empowering Indigenous nations to conserve these territories which have been done since time immemorial. So then how hopeful are you that uh, some real action will come out of this conference? I think, I think I'm, I'm optimistic on at least having uh, representation. We have a strong Indigenous caucus here um, that are doing their very best to to advocate. I, I just came out of a UK presidency uh, meeting with the Indigenous delegation, and uh, you know we're trying to communicate basically our concerns that this 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 summit specifically has been focused on that nature-based solutions, and so we want to be there to to really express our concerns um, and make sure that Indigenous peoples are empowered in those spaces. Skogwin, we'll have to leave it there, but do appreciate you taking some time from uh, Glasgow to speak with us. Absolutely. The pleasure is mine. Thank you. More than 65% of Winnipeg's homeless community identify as Indigenous. Results uh, from a recent survey coming up after the break. Welcome back. Whitefish Lake First Nation in Alberta has broken ground on a shelter for Indigenous people trying to escape violence. The $3.4 million shelter will have six units and 20 beds. The shelter is one of 12 to be built in First Nations communities across Canada. The costs and operations will be paid for by Indigenous Services Canada. Whitefish Lake Chief Albert Thunder says he expects to the shelter to be ready by next April. The, even the federal government is going to be funding the the program itself. So, uh, you know, every every woman that needs needs help or ch children that are running away from violence, we ha we'll have a sanctuary for them. 
A new homelessness report shows there were around 1,100 homeless people on one day in Winnipeg this year. Around two-thirds of those people identified as Indigenous. And homelessness Winnipeg partnered with shelters and outreach programs in April of this year. The results show 4% of the population were dependent children under the age of 18. There were also 54 homeless camps seen across the city, and 66% of all homeless people were Indigenous. And Homelessness Winnipeg says they plan to conduct a follow-up census this spring to dive deeper into homelessness demographics and data. And Jason Whitford says things have only gotten worse since April. I think what, what the pandemic has done is, is it's uh, revealed the sort of the, the iceberg, so to speak. The um, individuals that have might have been on, on the cusp of homelessness, like couch surfing or staying with friends or, or, or um, uh, other, other situations where there was uh, the, the scale somewhat tipped, uh, that, that what was, was not in their favor, whereas they, they may have had uh, up, um, temporary accommodations with family or friends. And during this time of the, the pandemic, we were in code red when we did this, uh, when we did this census. And that would have resulted in fewer people being able to stay with friends and relatives and forced to survival mode, whether it's on the streets or in encampments or in public places or use, utilizing the shelters. So it's exasperated. Still in Winnipeg, more tension between taxi cabs and Indigenous people. A Cree man from northern Manitoba says a recent ride left him angry and disappointed. He's filed a complaint with the city of Winnipeg. Robert Paul was in Winnipeg on October 22nd for an appointment and took a Unicity taxi from downtown Winnipeg to his hotel. He said with about $9 on the meter, the driver asked for payment. That's when he started to film the interaction and he refused to pay ahead of time. Paul said he was told to get out of the taxi the City of Winnipeg says as per the vehicle for hire bylaw, drivers have the right to refuse trips or ask for prepayment in instances where they feel their safety is at risk. Paul says he walked to a local 7-Eleven to find a different way home. Paul says he came forward for vulnerable people and to prevent future incidents. I have a responsibility here. You know what I mean? This, this garbage can't keep going on. It can't. And it's so, for some, for, for a young, you know, my, my, I have a daughter, I have nieces. I couldn't imagine them being 18 years old asking for a ride home and something like this going on and something bad happening to anybody, anybody. I don't, I don't care who it is, male, female, anybody. And something bad happening to them and knowing that I could have done something about it ahead of time and put a stop to this. To the west coast now where uh, debris is gathering on beaches on northern Vancouver Island from last week's accident involving a cargo ship. APTN's Tina House has more on this story. Cape Scott is known as one of the most rugged and pristine beaches on the west coast. Much of it is inaccessible by land, but by air we can see that it's now covered with debris from four shipping containers that have washed up on the beaches. On October the 22nd, the MV Zim Kingston reported a fire on board its ship and then reported 40 cargo containers that fell overboard in rough seas. However, that number has now grown to 109 shipping containers that fell overboard. Hereditary Chief David Mungo Knox of the Coquitl First Nation says what's happening on the beaches in his traditional territory is concerning. When I heard about the containers, it, it hit heavy home because like I say, it was just a matter of time before this happened because global warming is an issue. We're aware of it because of everything. The storms was happening all around the earth, around the earth right now. So it's uh, so we got to be mindful of thinking about the future storms. Everything from kids' toys, styrofoams, up to 70 refrigerators, plastic items, yoga mats, and shoes are now spread everywhere to see people coming up from Campbell River and Courtney and out from Port Hardy and Port McNeil just trying to pick up any little bit, just trying to get the styrofoam off the beach. Chief Knox says there needs to be tighter restrictions for these big ships moving in dangerous weather. 
I'm hoping that uh, these big billion dollar companies be mindful about the territory of the people of the coast and think about the, you know, the responsibilities. And, you know, to me, this was preventable because they could have delayed that ship by a few days from leaving port and then come after the storm passed. Observers say that wildlife has already began ingesting the colorful plastic. It blocks the digestive tract, gives them the sense that they're full when they're not, so they don't feed properly. It can impair survival. And for the First Nations who depend on traditional food from the ocean, it's going to be challenging. The reality about the styrofoam on plastic, it doesn't take long for it to break down in the oceans with the current, with the salt water degrading it. And, and the biodiversity about everything is like all these, our clams, our, our seabirds, our seagulls, all mammals are going to be ingesting this, thinking it's food over time. So to me, that's, that's pretty uh, heartbreaking. The Coast Guard is continuing to monitor the other 105 containers, but with another impending storm, they may also end up being washed ashore. Tina House, APT National News, Vancouver. Time for another quick break. Still to come, a major boost for an exhibit that honors residential school survivors. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. This is Fritz, and uh, the picture of Fritz was sent in by our viewer, Tess Potts. We'd love to see more of Fritz, and if you have any more pictures, Tess and all of our viewers can send their photos to share at aptn.ca for the chance to be featured as our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, 10 with showers for Halifax and Charlottetown. Four below with snow in Kujuak, snow and zero in Nain. Five above with showers in Montreal, plus one with flurries in Shibugamu. Three in Sault Ste. Marie, two with snow in North Bay. Plus three in Thunder Bay, plus one with snow for Sioux Lookout. Plus two in God's Lake, Norway House and Thompson. Five above under sunny skies in Winnipeg, one degree warmer in Brandon. Sunny and six in Regina, plus four in Saskatoon. Plus one with rain in Uranium City, two in La Ronge. In Northern Alberta, six in Fort McMurray, seven in Grand Prairie. Plus nine in Edmonton, eight in Lethbridge. Fifteen with showers in Vancouver, ten in rain in Penticton. Rain and nine for Prince George, minus one with snow in Deese Lake. Seven below was snow in Old Crow, two below and snow in Whitehorse. Plus four in Yellowknife, ten below in Norman Wells. Minus three in Saks Harbor and Politak. Six below in Chesterfield, zero in Whale Cove. Eighteen below for Resolute, minus six and snow in Joe Haven. The Mi'kmaq language will be recognized as the original language of the province of Nova Scotia. This comes after urgent calls from Mi'kmaq chiefs to preserve the language, as the number of people speaking Mi'kmaq is rapidly declining. The provincial government will co-develop legislation with the Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia to preserve, revitalize and protect the Mi'kmaq language. According to the province of Nova Scotia, the number of children under four years old learning to speak Mi'kmaq is declining, dropping over 20% over 14 years. Chief Leroy Denny of Eskasoni First Nation says reviving Indigenous language is more than childhood education. I know we can't just rely on children to, to save the language. It has to be a community and the outside community as well. We need governments. We need our young people to see beyond our community, to see the language, to hear the language. That's the key element of this legisla uh, legislation, that they'll see the uh, Nigma language across uh, the land. The Witness Blanket is an exhibit at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights in Winnipeg. 
showcasing the stories of residential school survivors. Today, the blanket got a boost from a major telecommunications company. Daryl Stranger has more. More than 800 items make up the witness blanket, all representing the stories of residential school survivors. Today, the project housed at the Canadian Human Rights Museum in Winnipeg got a major boost from TELUS Mobility. The cell phone service provider is committing $1 million to assist in a digital platform for the blanket. Aisha Khan speaks for the museum. Yeah, our, our goal is to create as close an experience to being able to witness the, uh, the witness blanket itself, uh, as you see it here in gallery. But we hope what people will take away is um, some understanding. We hope they'll feel something, that they'll be impacted by the stories of those survivors um, and that they'll do something with that information, uh, that they'll change the way that they work, that they'll decolonize the way that they think, will build, bring us closer together and connect us as a community. The piece was created by Coast Salish master carver Carrie Newman. In 2019, Newman agreed to work with the museum in Winnipeg to preserve this large piece. Newman says this investment will go a long ways to make sure the stories of survivors are not forgotten. In this digital format, we'll be able to tell more stories. So there's that aspect of it, right? Um, just being able to hear in the words of survivors about the various um, atrocities that occurred in residential school. Um, that's, that's one of the things that I think that is a takeaway from this. For years, the blanket was on a traveling tour, but wear and tear from that prompted Newman to stop it. This new digital exhibit will help teachers and students and eventually go into virtual reality. The finished platform is set to launch in 2022. Daryl Stranger, APTN National News, Winnipeg. The witness blanket is pretty incredible. We are lucky to have Carrie Newman on Face to Face. We have two guests coming up on tonight's episode of Face to Face. Brielle Morgan and Emily Gilpin are journalists and editors with Indigenews, a partnership between APTN and The Discourse. Indigenews aims to debunk stereotypes about Indigenous communities perpetrated by mainstream media. The seed that's been planted into the Canadian media landscape, one that continues to be watered and nurtured and will continue to grow. Um, and it's, it's, it's an example of independent media that's doing things differently, sharing um, community-based stories with a really high ethical standard of how we practice uh, journalism. So relationship-based reporting, trauma-informed reporting, anti-oppressive reporting. And you can catch that entire episode of Face to Face in less than two minutes time. Don't forget to tune in tomorrow to In Focus. That's uh, live at 3 p.m. Eastern time. And for news anytime, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for being with us. Stick around. Face to Face is next. Have a good night.